So welcome everyone to uh, obviously a, a change day for the Q&A. Obviously tomorrow's the fourth, so we don't want to interrupt the holiday for anybody, including ourselves. Um, and uh, we thought it important not to miss out on any of the Q&As we know. Uh, you know, it is an independent project. We do want you to be doing your own research, your own work. Uh, but uh, we don't want to leave you hanging. So uh, that said, uh, did not receive any Q&A on the Piazza for this week. Uh, so we're going to sort of just do this sort of off the cuff. But the way we're going to try to moderate this a little bit is if uh, you guys can post your Q&A in the Q&A uh, window, and we'll we'll let a, f a minute or two pass and you should upvote the questions you think are the most uh, relevant or most important to be answered and we'll try to answer them in that order. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but again, um, we, we just wanna make sure we answer the most salient ones first. So uh, we'll, I think maybe we'll give it two or three minutes each time just to give people a chance to post and read and upvote. So uh, around 4.05 by my clock, uh, we'll start answering. So go ahead and start tossing your questions in there. All right, so we just ticked over. Um, so let's get started with answering some questions. So first, the top question, how do you recommend to view and modify the config YAML file? Um, so the YAML file, or um, yet another markup language uh, file, is um, basically just a text file. Um, you can edit it with any, what I would recommend, any plain text editor. So on the Pi itself, that would be something like Nano, or you can install Vim or VI. Um, there, if you're doing the desktop version of the Pi, if you're actually connected to monitor, you're doing some X forwarding or VNC. Um, you could use, uh, I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head which text clients are on the res, uh, Raspberry Pi image by default, but there should be some. Um, but just to uh, you know, uh, give you an idea, let me go ahead and uh, show you how I might do that. Um, uh, ta -ta -ta, this one, okay, so. You know, here's the config.yaml. Um, I'm gonna just uh, view the raw real quick so I can. So I'm on a Windows machine. Um, so I could just, uh, uh, so, you know, so this is the config.yaml and, you know, I just, I just put a notepad. So you can edit it as you'd like in any plain text editor and then save it. You know, and just make sure you save it as a plain text. You know, don't apply any extra encoding, UTF-8. Um, don't do any rich text formats. You don't want to introduce any unseen formatting that might uh, mess up the parser, but uh, for the most part, most text errors are plain text. Um, that's how I would recommend viewing and editing. Okay, so next question. Can you remind us again what the balance between battery life and frequency slash timing of pings out exactly is and where we can see it in the pies? Okay, so um, you know our baseline configuration we provided to you is with the um, wall warts, right? With the uh, power adapters you plug into, you know, a standard outlet. So obviously there's no, uh, battery considerations there. Now, a lot, there's been a lot of discussions about making it more portable by attaching a battery. Um, there's no <laughs> formula we can give you. Um, you know, we, we don't have the measurements to say, you know, if you advertise this at this interval with this transmit power, with this payload, or you scan this often, um, all these sort of factors, um, how they impact battery life, we can't give you any precise quantification of. What we can tell you, though, is a very couple of very simple like rules of thumb. If you transmit, if you advertise more often, so particularly if you reduce the interval, all right. So you know, 
by default, this was like 200 milliseconds. If I, if I make it 20 milliseconds, one might nominally think that you're, or you're, you're advertising 10 times more often. So you might think you're using up 10 times more power. Now, uh, power does not translate in directly into battery drain. It generally translates into a little bit more battery drain than just uh, that multiplier. But um, the more often you s advertise or the more often you scan, you're more like you're going to drain the battery faster. Um, and where you can see it on the pies, you, you, can, the, you can see the rate at which you're advertising and, the, uh, and scanning based on the configuration, but the Pi does not have any battery sensor, right? It is just receiving power. It, is not, it does not know the other, the, what's supplying the power is a battery. Um, so it, it has no way of, of seeing battery status. Now, if your battery has like, you know, an indicator of its status, like some of the larger power packs have lights that say, you know, have five little blue LEDs and, you know, five is fully charged and four is 80% and three is 60%. Um, that's some indication, but it's not very precise. Um, what you could do if you wanted is you could get a battery monitor in the middle or at least a current monitor and you could put it between the Pi and the battery pack and then looking at the specs on the uh, battery, you can tell how much voltage is being pulled from the battery, depending on how you're using it. But that's the best we could suggest. There's no, there's nothing sort of standard uh, that we could provide. What are the topics for next week? So we're going to discuss basically how to do uh, proximity detection or, or yeah, we're going to discuss the basics of proximity detection using RSSI measurements. And a lot of it's going to revolve around a, a, co a concept called detection theory. Um, there's been a lot of great hypotheses I've, I've reviewed and, and uh, discussion about how do I translate RSSI into a declaration that two devices are close together or far apart. And we'll go over some very basic ways to do it. We'll go over some slightly more complicated ways and then give you some hints on some particularly, some fairly advanced ways of doing it. But I wanna emphasize, really emphasize that the choice of how to do it is up to you. Um, anything we talk about next week that we discuss, um, take it as an option. Don't take it as a recipe or a prescription. You need to evaluate it for whether or not it fits what you want to do or doesn't and um, go from there. And of course, we're happy to help you evaluate um, whether an idea is you know, feasible, not feasible, more promising, less promising, but we're not going to tell you that it's the solution or not the solution. That's up to you to evaluate. Next question, is it possible to set up an iBeacon on an Android phone that can be picked up by the RPIs? Yes, I believe so. Uh, at least my experience has shown. If you use the NRF scanner, or uh, what is it? What did I call it? I forget. Um, so this is this is what it is on on Android. But it's the same thing on uh, or on iOS, but it's the same thing on um, very similar on Android. Uh, here it is. So if you go if you go to this. This should let you set up an iBeacon that you should be able to pick up on the RPIs. There are other beacon apps if you just type uh, Bluetooth beacon uh, into the Play Store or the iOS Store, um, you will find a number of apps that will let you create iBeacons. And um, I want to remind everybody that the reference code we've provided you is designed to do very tight coupling between the Pies, uh, particularly with the Pi advertising a beacon using the reference code and a Pi scanning for a beacon using the reference code. So they're very much suited to ignore other things. But if you do your research, if you do your exploration about Pi Blue Z and Gatlib, you'll find that those libraries let you scan for devices that are not the Pi's, that, uh, that are not the Pi's or using the reference code. Um, so you can definitely broaden the scope of the devices you see, but you know we wanted to provide you a very controlled, 
set of code where there was no ambiguity about what you're getting. Um, okay. Uh, so how do you expect adjusting TX power to have uh, I'm assuming what you mean. What what effect do you expect to expect adjusting TX power to have on the RSSI? Uh, I use various TX powers ranging from minus 20 to 4, and it seemed like my RSSI plots were nearly identical. Yes. So um, there's actually a good Piazza post about this. I forget which number it is. Um, but uh, the concept here is uh, remember the TX power you're specifying is not only adjusting the transmit power that is actually being used by the advertiser, but also the TX power that is included in the message that the advertiser provides. So it's actually telling anything that here's the beacon that, hey, I'm transmitting at this transmit power. And so the thing that's receiving that beacon or hearing that beacon can actually compensate, right? So let's just use a very simple example. Um, so typically one way path loss has what's called an R to the squared loss for every, um, for every multiple, uh, every change in, uh, range by a factor of X, you lose X squared amount of energy, uh, at the receiving end. Um, so in order to overcome that, you know, you might, uh, want to transmit at four times as much power. If you have, if you double the range, right? So now the thing that is hearing the beacon can say, Hey, look, you know, I know you're either transmitting more loudly or less loudly. And I know that the, remember RSSI stands for relative signal strength indicator relative. That means it's automatically doing some compensation. So those RSSI values should not change too much unless other things are changing. However, the transfer power does have meaningfulness in the sense of in order to broadcast further or to get through certain obstructions or to ensure that the beacon is heard, you m would want to transmit at high power levels, you know, but that won't change the RSSI value. Um, okay. How can I tell what frequency was in use when sending or receiving the chirp? Um, unfortunately, you can't, unless you have a spectrum analyzer um, and, then t and an antenna. Um, there's, that information is not included in any of the standard Bluetooth packets. Um, all I can tell you is that uh, there are a few papers that I could uh, probably go and post in Piazza that sort of tell you, give some indications of typical advertising schemes, uh, basically how they rotate through certain frequencies and certain power levels. Um, but there's no guarantee that's what the pie is doing. We have not actually done the characterization to understand necessarily how it's doing, but uh, that's, uh, that's something uh, you can't measure unless you have a separate piece of equipment. And I'm not going to tell you to go and get a spectrum analyzer anytime soon. That's going to cost a little bit more than the pies. Add about three or four zeros behind it, and you probably got how much that thing costs. Uh, how would you recommend that we work in the metric or imperial system? Uh, oh, sorry. I totally butchered that question. Would you recommend that we work in the metric or imperial system? Uh, no strict recommendations. My personal preference is just metric. Uh, you know, speed of light is a lot of easier to remember in metric. Three, you know, the rough speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Um, you know, kilometer, uh, metrics just generally easier in my opinion, but uh, as long as you're clear about what your units are, no, no preference. Um, next question, what specific data should we be collecting from the pies? And should we be taking the average of the RSSIs? Okay, so the, uh, remember, the only piece of information that is actually empirically measured, right, is actual observations, is the RSSI value. That's the only thing that is actually um, empirical. Everything else you hear, the UID, the major, the minor, the TX power, uh, yeah, anything else is all fixed. It's all part of the beacon configuration. So 
that you don't need to measure. You may want to document what it is so that you know the settings, all right? But those are settings. They're not observations or measurements. Now, in terms of whether or not to average RSSI or not, that is an open question for you guys to figure out. So I'm gonna, we'll get into this more next week when we talk about detection, but I'll just give you a very simple uh, anal or analogy. Let's say, okay, you, there's, there's 10 of us in a, or 10 people in a house and we're trying to figure out how warm it is, how, what the temperature, temperature it is uh, inside the house, okay? Uh, if you ask one person what the temperature is, they're gonna give you an answer, all right? The question you have to ask yourself now is, do I believe that is an accurate estimate based on this one person's observation? Would you, or should I ask another person, right? If I ask two people, now what do I do with those two pieces of information? As was suggested, maybe I average them. Maybe I take the median. Maybe I take the mode. Uh, maybe I take the most, the majority, right? Maybe more, more than one person says the same temperature and I just look for the one, well, that's the mode, sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, or maybe I take some sort of weighted average, you know? Uh, based on other factors. How you combine multiple observations is up to you. And it goes towards how, what is your confidence in the decision or the um, conclusion you're making on the basis of those observations. Uh, the only caveat I have to give you is remember that in order to collect multiple RSSIs, you have to listen or scan for a certain amount of time. The longer you scan, the more likely things that you are not directly observing are going to change. And therefore, those multiple observations may not be correlated to the same thing. So for example, in a very extreme example, if I scan for like two hours, you know, extremely uh, uh, extreme example, and it ra starts raining halfway through those two hours, then the observations I made in hour one are not the same as observations I made in, in uh, hour two. And I probably shouldn't combine them naively. So you have to think about those considerations. There's no, there's no simple rule of thumb, okay? Um, can you go over how to use RSSI to collect data? Um, so, it isn't that you're using RSSI to collect data. The data you're collecting is RSSI measurements, all right? The RSSI is the metric, the observable, the variable which you're measuring, all right? So I guess if, I, if I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna just try to find you guys an example. Oh, look, it, look. <laughs> This is somewhat salient. Uh, okay, so if you look at this graph, this is sort of a graph of somebody's collected some RSSI data and they've actually collected it by function of distance. So they've measured the received signal strength indicator values at various discrete distances and these error bars are confidence intervals represents the range of values they've collected. So you're gonna collect similar data and very simply, you know, that for example, in our, in our sort of canonical setup, two meters, uh, you know, for a lot of folks is the, is the threshold between being too close and being far enough. So if you're on the left side of two meters, then you're too close to somebody. And if you're on the right side of two meters, you're far enough away. So you're gonna to wanna to collect this sort of data and see like, oh, is there some sort of threshold in RSSI value by which I can sort of declare that these, that if the RSSI value is above this, that I'm too close and below this, I'm far enough away. And I wanna guarantee you that the plots you collect are not gonna look this clean. Uh, this is, 
definitely not sort of standard um, Bluetooth beacon RSSI data. This is more probably paired uh, devices talking to each other. Uh, so, but this is the sort of data you're going to collect. All right. Uh, I'm going to answer a few more, and then we're going to open it back up, or open it. We're going to take another break for people to read and then upload. A follow-up to my question on Piazza: If the revisit interval is changed, do you expect the power consumption change to be significant enough to be seen on a USB-C power meter? Um, for the scanning revisit interval, probably not. Probably not. I would expect you might see a difference with the more significantly with the beacon advertisement because that is happening, that can go pretty quickly. We can take it all the way down to almost 20 milliseconds. So if you think about dialing it between 20 and maybe 20 milliseconds up to a second, there's a pretty big difference in the number of transmissions that are be, being made. Scanning is a more pass, and plus advertising is an active transmission. You had to broadcast energy. Scanning is a passive activity. You're listening, so you don't actually have to use as much energy. Okay, um, what kind of documentation should we be doing as we perform experiments? So for those of you who have done, you know, physics labs or biology labs or anything like that, go back to the basics of keeping a lab notebook, right? You want to document your, what, the, what you're trying to test, you know, or what you're trying to observe. You need to document the control variables. You need to document the free variables. And then you want to keep sort of test notes, things that happen as you're actually conducting the test, things that were not according to plan. You know, a good example was my, my plan was to collect data in an unobstructed environment, but lo and behold, somebody walked through between the devices when I was conducting the test at this time. So that when you go and look at your data, you have the doc, you have the clear note that tells you that this part of the data has been biased in some way that I had not originally planned for, right? The point of the documentation in the notes is so that when you go and revisit this data, you know, not, you know, uh, you know, a day later, two days later, a week later, that you're not guessing why certain chunks of data look different than other chunks of data. If they look different because, uh, you know, if, if nothing, ha if everything gone to plan, but they, they don't sort of obey your hypothesis or they're not consistent, then clearly what you should take away from that is the, the, the notion that there's a variable that you're not accounting for and that you need to investigate. And that's just part of the research process. You always encounter things that your original premise, your original setup did not originally account for. All right. What does TX power of minus 999.0 mean? Is this considered a strong TX power or a weak TX power? Also, what is considered to be normal TX power for, let's say, an iPhone, Android, or R Pi, or Raspberry Pi? Um, so uh, TX power is measured in what's called dB m or decibel milliwatts so it is uh it is 10 times log 10 of how many milliwatts of power are being transmitted so minus 999 in the linear or just in pure milliwatts is 10 raised to the minus 99th point nine all right, so you can imagine that's, and that's in milliwatts. So add an extra, it's minus 112.9 watts. So it's an extremely small value. So it's almost not, it's not transmitting at all, really at all. all. It is going in the other direction, larger, more positive values, or sorry, more positive values are larger transmission values or stronger transmissions. Um, what is considered normal TX power for, let's say, an iPhone or Android? Um, so for iPhones, just because the devices are more uniform, right? Apple controls the device and the OS and everything. Um, you can go look up what the nominal transmission level should be. But for, you know, Androids, uh, it varies because every manufacturer is going to do something a little bit different. Um, it's up to the, the hardware manufacturer to decide when, when I receive a TX power flag of one, 
this is how much power I'm going to transmit. It's not standardized, unfortunately, which is why we gave you the Raspberry Pi. Um, for the Raspberry Pi, uh, I have to go look. We've done some anechoic chamber tests just to understand how much power is being transmitted, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll try to get you guys that in, on Piazza. All right, um, so we're gonna take a two or three minute break. I'm gonna let a few more questions trickle in and then also, uh, also uh, let uh, people upvote things as they see fit. And just a reminder, um, if you have specific like sort of still setup questions, um, please put those on Piazza. It's just a lot easier to handle those. Like if you're still having trouble getting your Raspberry Pi configured or connected or even functioning, um, put those on Piazza. It's just a lot easier for us to work through those then. Um, this, is, this is a better forum to answer those more sort of conceptual, how do I conduct experiments? How do I analyze data questions? Is this right or wrong? Um, sort of, or is this a is this a completely wrong approach? Again, I'm not going to tell you it's the right approach. That's for you to figure out. But uh, that said, um, we'll give it a, another minute before we start resuming questions. All right, I think we got some good questions here. All right, so there's a question about. Uh, um, you know, it, it's taken some time to get everything set up and you've only started your data collections recently, will you be able to make up the time? Um, in my opinion, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we realize, uh, you know, not, you know, we, we haven't given you a strict timeline and we haven't, um, we know everybody, since this is an independent project, everybody should proceed at the pace that is uh, not letting them, that they are actually understanding the things they're doing. Don't rush ahead because um, you're worried about falling behind. If you are at the point where you feel like you have less time to do your data collections and then consequently your analysis, um, just scale things, scale everything, right? Don't, don't pick hypotheses that are super grand, like narrow it up. Look at some small slice of the problem and, and put real authentic effort behind it. So I would really recommend that, you know, you think carefully that I have this much time left before I need to submit my final report. And I recommend everybody takes, you know, starts writing their final report and, and at least start in their last week so you're not like last minute rush, right? We're not looking for a novel, but you wanna spend at least a few days on it. Um, so if I only have two or three weeks left, uh, what hypothesis can I test? Maybe instead of the, you know, solve the whole problem of can I separate pe when people are within two meters and uh, beyond two meters, I focus on um, detecting, uh, focus on characterizing how our society varies when uh, they're, you know, when it's inside a pocket and outside a pocket, or when the, antennas are pointed at each other when they're not pointed at each other. You know, you can narrow up the hypotheses. And again, the hypotheses don't need to be solving the whole problem. They can be as narrow as you decide, but you need, when you pick something, you need to apply due diligence, right? We're looking for you to take it, you know, take it to as far as you can take it. Um, next question, what type of graph would best fit our collected RSSI values? I assume by this question um, that you're referring to what format of graph, not necessarily what shape of graph. Um, I think this sort of graph, if you're just presenting like this is the data I collected, uh, a line graph with markers and error bars or confidence intervals is a great way to do it. It's very easy to visualize. You can add this, you can add trend lines. You know, Excel is great for this, MATLAB, matplotlib, uh, these all have these, this functionality. Um, you know, if you're, if you wanna, if you're doing some sort of distribution analysis, so I was saying like, this is the data when I'm within uh, two meters and this is the data when I'm beyond two meters, maybe you wanna show 
something that's more like a probability that, uh, you know, something that's more like a, a binomial test distribution. Um, you know, something more akin to this. Um, you know, that, that sort of shows like, oh, the, the, blue, the blue line is when I'm within two meters and the red line is when I'm beyond and, and yellow is right at two meters. Um, you know, and that's, that, that's a form of a histogram effectively, or you could do CDFs, which are pretty common. There's lots of ways to do this, but it really does depend on how you, what your intent of presenting the data is about. And um, there's, a, there's really no wrong answer, trust me. Um, as long as you describe what the graph is supposed to be presenting, uh, it'll be pretty easy to extrapolate it into other uh, conclusions. Is there a data set that shows people that contracted COVID-19 after being a certain distance for a specific amount of time? I need this to train my data set and make a relationship between RSSI and distance slash time in COVID contraction. Excellent, excellent question. Um, there is no definitive assessment of this. Um, the, the numbers that are often put out there are two meters in 10 minutes. Um, and this is just based on public health, CDC recommendations, um, that um, I personally have found little sort of um, supporting evidence or that at least little published evidence that says this is why. Um, you know, there haven't been a lot of longitudinal long-term studies that justify if two meters is the right distance and 10 minutes is the right amount of time. And more specifically, when you think about it, shouldn't it have more to do with like, well, if, is it two meters and 10 minutes? and it's always 10 minutes or is it if i come in by one meter is it now i can only be uh, uh, if i'm close uh the time halves you know is it a linear relationship or is it actually something different like more quadratic right if i'm up front like you know face to face with somebody is is it 10 seconds you know i understand that's your question and i wish i could give you a clear answer what i might suggest you do all right, is just pick, pick a model that you think, um, you know, maybe we can have a discussion uh, and I can help do some of this research with you guys, is if we can at least figure out like, what are, the, what are a couple of points on this line of time and distance, right? Two meters and 10 minutes versus, you know, Two inch or two centimeters, and in two seconds, uh, what sort of curve we would want to draw between them, right? Would it be as, as a linear fit, uh, uh, some sort of quadratic, or some sort of other exponent? Um, we could figure this out, and at least we'd have something to reference. It might not be right um, in due time. Studies may show that it, it was a different curve, but at least we would have something to sort of model against. Um, so we'll take an action item. Sorry, I'm talking like I'm talking in my <laughs> daily work. We'll take. We'll try to help you guys out with that. Um, and please, if anyone finds something in their own research, please post it on Piazza. I think that would be a great thing for others to benefit from. All right. Would it be okay to ignore data that seems to skew my data a lot? I had a huge bulge in a graph of the mode of our society for each distance, and it would be hard to make any sort of model creation a lot harder, right? Um, yeah, I think it's absolutely okay. So um, keep in mind a couple of things, right? Uh, when you collect data, right, you're, you're receiving our SSI values, you can apply additional filtering to that data, right? You can decide which data you wanna accept or reject um, uh, in, in the overall algorithm or overall proximity detection scheme. And we generally call that step filtering or pre-filtering the data. Um, and this is often applied to uh, remove what are called outliers or noise. Um, a really great example of this is uh, radio astronomy or, um, or uh, shot noise removal from electron microscopes. Uh, they will remove like very high intensity signals because they're transient and they skew the data significantly. 
Um, so you're absolutely welcome to do that. Now the, the challenge is if there's so much data that it looks like a distribution unto itself, maybe you're throwing away authentic data, right? Don't throw away data just to fit, uh, to get a distribution that fits nicely with your conclusion. Throw away data that seems to arbitrarily bias or skew your data. Um, but you're gonna have to make that judgment call for yourself. And I think, but when it comes to the final algorithm, it is up to you or the final approach, it is up to you to decide which data to consider and not to consider. Um, that is entirely uh, up to you as part of the design. Um, is it possible for the scanner to have a scanning interval of less than one second? Unfortunately, um, at least not with PyBlueZ um, and not on top of the GATLIB uh, library. I've tried hacking into it a little bit and it's, taken, it's taking a little bit more work than I'd like. Um, I wish I could have a better answer for you. The, the best I, yeah, I don't have a better answer at the moment. Uh, if, I, if I manage to improve it, I will publish that but um, it's a limitation at the moment. What uses more power, scanning for beacons or advertising a beacon? Generally advertising, because it's an active transmission. You're, you're at this, use the analogy of your voice, uh, of speaking and listening. Um, you're going to run out of energy speaking uh, more quickly than you're going to run out of energy just listening. That is, that is generally the rule of thumb. How's the final submission going to be formatted? Um, so at the end of week five, we are going to give you a template for what the final report should look like. Um, it will give you a combination of a Word template along with a LaTeX template and just a general like um, a guideline, uh, like a, a bullet list of the sections we expect. And that's basically what the template is going to look like. It's going to be you should have a section on in, an introduction, a description of your hypothesis, your experimental approach, your, uh, the data you collected, uh, your algorithm design, if you did an algorithm design, uh, and then your conclusions. And we'll give you some sort of placeholders for maybe how we, uh, you know, some standard sort of things like you gotta put labels on your axes and you gotta put captions, you know, pretty standard stuff that you would see when you're writing any sort of term paper or a scientific academic paper. If I'm feeling particularly, uh, what's the right word? Mean, I might just give you the IEEE <laughs> template um, to work off of, which uh, you know some of you are gonna embrace and some of you are not, but uh, better than today, we're mostly looking for you to fill in sections, not to follow a strict guideline of f formatting that everything needs to be 12 point, you know, sans serif, you know, courier, uh, you know, 1.1, 1 .1, you know, line spacing, not, nothing so pedantic. About which dis range of distances should we focus on? Um, I can't answer that. That is entirely a function of what your hypothesis or what you're trying to explore. If you're focused on doing the general sort of packed contact tracing uh, application, then you probably want to sp focus on things from, you know, the zero meters to, you know, maybe 10 or 15 meters, all distances between, because you want to qualify when you're too close or when you're far enough. Um, but if you're focusing on just the too close regime, you may, you will be just focusing on zero to two meters. And if you're just focusing on the far enough regime, you, then you focus on beyond two meters. Or, you know, you're talking about, uh, I want to make sure my hypothesis is about testing uh, or making sure we don't report false detections or false positives in an office environment. I'm going to use sort of the, the standard office, you know, a standard office building layout that every office or cubicle is this big and is separated by this much distance and therefore people are this far apart, you focus on that distance. Um, there's no, there's no uh, rule, there's no uh, general guideline. It depends on what you're trying to explore. 
how might we adjust the revisit interval to a decimal value? So far, I can only use positive integers. Uh, so this is a consequence of the C library that's being um, basically boosted in Python. So the pi blue z um, basically provides a wrapper to the C, to C implementation. And the C implementation only exposes integer values for that uh, um, revisit, I think. Hold on. Let me actually go take a quick look at something. Uh, I can answer this myself. So we go look at pypack.py. We scroll down to where the revisit is actually being used, uh, which is in scan. There we go, scan, run, time stamps, time stamps, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so you can see here that this line here is basically, we're calling that C function. Um, that C function only takes integer values. So we're, we're restricted to integer values, unfortunately. It's, it's an unfortunate consequence. Again, this goes to, and I'll try to expose more controllability, but at the moment I haven't yet. Um, where should we write a report? Google Doc, Markdown file, and GitHub. Um, so you're gonna be submitting your final reports to a Google Drive, um, but you can write it wherever you'd like. You can write it in Google Docs, write it in Word, write it on, in Markdown and GitHub, um, just as long as you sort of follow the format. Um, you know, and uh, but we we are we are expecting you to submit basically a PDF um, to this Google Drive. So where you write it is up to you. What exactly is the goal for this project? Should I try to develop an app? <laughs> so the goal for this project again is a lot of it is just self exploration is just self research self exploration under the broad category of doing of enabling contact tracing using bluetooth technology all right so for some people that is going to be to develop a detection scheme that allows us to declare when somebody's too close for too long versus not too close for too long um, so they're going to have to collect data they're going to have to develop an algorithm and they're going to have to evaluate it for some people, the focus is on collecting the phenomenology, and I've used this word for some people, so I might as well explain it. Phenomenology refers to the observation of the phenomena around a certain test or environment or experiment. And so phenomenology, for when it comes to this project, refers to how does our society vary as a function of everything that's going on, the configuration of the beacons, of the scanner, of what's going on in the environment, the obstructions that are present, et cetera, et cetera. And so some people are gonna be focused on collecting as much phenomenology as possible and making conclusions about the feasibility of doing Bluetooth-based contact tracing based on the phenomenology. And to your point, maybe some people wanna take it all the way to the endpoint of writing an app to do this. But, you know, the endpoint is not the same for everybody. It's not the same. The only common thread is that you want to work on something that helps us understand how to execute, how to implement, how to realize contact tracing using Bluetooth technology better. All right? So, any knowledge, any conclusions, any experiments you bring that help us answer that question, it's entire, will yield an entirely valid goal. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. All right. Uh, I know we have talked over about the usage of mics from each personal device being inefficient due to high battery usage, but could my, absolutely. Uh, but sorry, let me read the whole question. That's unfair to everybody. I know we have talked about the usage of mics from each personal device being inefficient due to high battery usage, but could my hypothesis include the microphone as an input device as such? Absolutely. There's no, there's no issue with that. You could absolutely include that. Um, I think it, it, you, 
um, one section that we'll include on the report is going to be about what we would call a next steps section. So um, odds are good that um, for the vast majority of you, um, how far you're gonna take this project, it will not be to the point where you say like, this is gonna solve the whole contact tracing with Bluetooth, right? Um, so even, right, if you're just working on the Raspberry Pis, the gap that exists to deploy this to the real world is um, either how do we get Raspberry Pis in everybody's hands in this, and, and along with the way for them to travel with them, or how do we extend the basic technology we've developed here onto the heterogeneous smartphone environment, right? The fact that everyone has different phones, different devices. And that, that would be a next step, right? Doing that exploration. For the microphone example, the next step would be how do I overcome the battery, the increased battery load this might incur? Um, you know, is it by increasing battery, somehow getting more uh, battery in, in various devices or being uh, getting a more efficient use of the microphone? Um, so you should keep track of the things that seem to be troublesome with your concept or preventing them from being applied in the real world uh, without further work as the next steps uh, because that's going to be very important. Um, if I could, f uh, it's the next question. If I could find a Python library to put one of my pies into Wi-Fi promiscuous slash modern mode, could I combine that RSSI with BLE RSSI for my project? Absolutely. Same thing. Um, we are absolutely not limiting you to use RSSI. The only reason to use Bluetooth RSSI is that, for, or two reasons to use it, is one, um, Pact is primarily focused on that, and two, Bluetooth um, has uh, sufficient mechanisms to provision sort of privacy, um, privacy maintaining, or at least privacy um, encouraging uh, mechanisms. While that's not always true for other approaches, uh, but you know you're more than welcome to use Wi-Fi to get extra sensors. You want to put a photometer on there. You want to put a temp or a immunity sensor on there. Go for it. Um, just again, just you know, don't don't uh, don't create a monster that's so big and so complicated that setting it up takes all the time you have. Um, you want to sort of roll through the steps of collecting data and doing some analysis at some point. All right. Um, I know this might fall better under next week's discussion, but out of curiosity, what is the desired accuracy range for predicting distances given RSSI? Um, great question. Um, so it kind of gets down to what is your fundamental goal, right? There is a, it, it's a subtle difference. Um, so if your goal is to estimate the distance at which two devices are or separ are separated by, um, you're doing an estimation problem, right? You're trying to say in the infinite number of distances or maybe a discrete number of distances, which goes to the accuracy part of your question. Um, I want to declare that two devices are, uh, are this far apart. And so, you want to be ultra. You want to be as accurate as possible. So, if two devices are 2.5 meters apart, I want to be as close to 2.5 meters in my estimate. However, if your goal is to say that two devices are separate, are or are not separate by more than two meters, you are doing what's called a detection or a binary hypothesis test. At which point, the accuracy is not about estimating distance, but about how accurate you are in doing that separation of those two distance regimes, about being further than two meters and being closer than two meters. Now, to make that qualification, you do need to sort of declare what distance you think somebody's at, but you don't necessarily need to be accurate, right? If somebody is six meters away, then you don't necessarily need to be super accurate about six meters, you need to be close enough that you're far enough away from that two meter threshold that you're, you have a confident answer. So it just sort of depends on what your goal is. Um, having a very accurate distance estimation approach will naturally lead to having a very accurate proximity detection approach. But, it, but 
as you might suspect, getting a very accurate distance estimate may be harder to do than just sort of trying to declare whether somebody's within two meters or not. Um, there are pros and cons to, all, to both sides of this, um, but I'm gonna leave it to you guys to explore that. Um, is there a limit to how much data we can leave on the pies? It is recommended to delete data files from the... Um, so we gave you 16 gigabyte cards. Um, the actual image, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Okay, here we go. So if you look here, um, let me make that real big. So, so you can look here, the image, the raw image by itself uh, is, is actually more like four gigabytes. This is, I believe this is the compressed size. We're giving you 16 gigabyte cards. You're writing text files. You could probably create thousands upon thousands of them before you get anywhere, you know, tens of thousands of them before you get anywhere near filling up that card. Um, I think you just probably want to um, take data off the SD card at, at regular increments just for organization standpoint. You just don't want to, uh, you just don't want again to have it uh, get into a situation where you have 10,000 files and suddenly you, it's, it's almost, it's, it becomes a, as much of a pain to sort through them, figure out what, what each, because again, all you can see from the outside is the file name, which may not, may or may not be descriptive enough for you to tell which of 10,000 files you're looking for. How do I export the RSSI results as an Excel file? Uh, so uh, the, the reference code writes the RSSI values to a comma separated value file that Excel can read in natively. Almost any spreadsheet software can read comma separated value files uh, directly. Um, if your question is about how to get it from your Pi to your Windows device or your Mac or whatever, uh, you can use any number of FTP. There is a Piazza post about this. Um, you know, FileZilla, WinSCP, Core FTP, just a standard SCP um, um, protocol would do it. Um, so I would recommend you go look through the Piazza post to search for um, WinSCP or SCP, and you're going to find that answer. Uh, so we'll take two more questions, and then the rest um, we'll try to get to on the, oh, and just to clarify, somebody offered in the q and I have about 6.8 gigabytes free using the pre-configured image. So I was, I must have bloated it up a little bit. Um, so yeah, with six gigabyte, with at least six gigabytes, you should be fine for the scope of this project, but you can always, you know, offload data. Once we analyze our data, can we use some sort of statistical analysis to figure out whether it is significant or not? Um, so that's a loaded question in some sense. Statistical significance is almost always in the eye of the beholder. Um, uh, and it sort of gets down to what is the underlying distribution you're trying, you believe you're trying to model. Um, you could assume that RSSI values are modeled by a normal or a Gaussian distribution, and you could use like, you know, conference intervals, 90, you know, the 90%, uh, sorry, uh, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma conference intervals. Uh, you can model the uniform distribution and just say, you know, uh, what, is, what is a statistical test that allows me to do, uh, 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 establish a CDF with certain number of samples. Uh, there's no really clear answer. I think uh, for these purposes, what is probably more important than not is that for the variations in the data you're trying to capture, that you capture all, um, approximately equal amounts of data for each variation so that there isn't an unfair treatment of different conditions. Okay, uh, second to last question. Is it okay to train a model on, an, on only an existing data set if I credit the data set? Do I have to collect my own data for use in the training set? No, no, absolutely, yeah, great, absolutely, go for it. I think what you're probably going to, I'll, I'll be highly interested, so this gets down to a machine learning uh, question about generalization, right? If you train on one data set that comes from 
presumptively not or presumptively not exclusively Raspberry Pis. Uh, and then you go and test on data that is collected exclusively on Raspberry Pis, does your model generalize, right? Can it adapt? Because we know in a number of other realms, whether it be images or radar or speech or whatnot, um, you can overtrain or overfit on data and therefore lose generalization power on other data. Um, so I'd be very interested to see what, you, what your conclusions are and it'd be a very interesting experience, so go for it. Um, I would say just, you know, you may want to consider collecting some training data so that you could quantify the difference. You know, it's going to be a little hard to assess generalization power. if You don't have a reference point for when it should have worked, right? If, if your machine learning algorithm cannot work, on training data that is all from Raspberry Pis. Um, I personally would be very hesitant to make any conclusions of that algorithm using data when it's trained, when using training data not from Raspberry Pis, because you have, you don't, I mean, in, it may be that the algorithm is itself flawed. Uh, if our revisit interval is one second, our interval of advertising is 200 milliseconds. How does scanner always catch the beacons from the advertiser? What do we expect for the scanning lengths and beacons lengths to miss at some point? Excellent question. Um, so let me, it's a little different. Uh, so, and this is a subtlety. So what, when, when the scanning interval is one second revisit, what it's basically doing is saying, I'm gonna scan continuously for one second. I'm gonna collect all the beacons I see in that one second, and I'm gonna report out each beacon once. I'm gonna make one report about each beacon. So if we look at one second of scanning to 200 millisecond interval of uh, advertising, you, you know, if those things were perfectly lined up, you would see five advertisement, or technically maybe six, um, six ad beacon advertisements. But those six beacon advertisements, you're going to only really only see the first one, or depending on the software stack, it's gonna collapse them all into one. So you're not actually seeing all the advertisements that are going on. So that's why you always catch at least one. Um, that's why, uh, sometimes if you make the revisit interval too large, you run the risk of missing variation in the data you would want to see because you're collapsing um, the advertisements into one report per beacon. Okay, so we've only got three more questions, so I'm just gonna go for it just so we can end cleanly. How long should an acceptable data collection duration be? Uh, no clear, no straight answer on that. That's, it just depends on the, how you're conducting your experiment. If you are doing some distance-based, uh, you know, discrete distance-based experiment where you want to collect data at discrete distances, maybe it uh, makes sense just to uh, collect for a very long time and then uh, just parse up the data later. Or you want to turn it on and off, you know, 60 seconds at this distance, 60 seconds at this distance, you know. Um, it just it's it just is a matter of process. It just depends on how you want to conduct the experiment. Is there an absolute value variation of RSSI as a way to measure how much power we need to get through obstruction? Um, so DBM is so again de the value is reported as decibel milliwatts, which is a lot of the rhythmic value. So you need, uh, so the negative values are meaningful. They represent less than zero linear values. So go look up how logarithms work. You'll understand why there's negative values. Um, it is a true, power cannot be negative. Energy cannot be negative. So you're actually getting, um, if you prefer sort of strictly positive values, you can convert decibel milliwatts into just milliwatts by doing that conversion by taking the DBM value and, and doing 10 raised to that DBM minus 10. You know, in fact, I'm just gonna write the formula here. You know, um, come 
on good big okay you know if you do 10 raised to the db m value divided by 10 that's the conversion um you know and and vice versa you know this is the value that yields you know if you take the milliwatt value and you and you uh, do 10 times log 10 of that value that's what you get dbm so that this is these are the formulas so you know you can do that might the issue with only whole numbers freeze it because the parser has an int and not a float so we only added the the int construction on the parser and python it's because the underlying c uh implementation has the int cast um so it's it's being cast in int regardless so we we're only doing it that way just to ensure that you know what value you're putting in right if it's better to know for certain that when you put in one uh, if you put in 1.5 that you're getting 1.5 and not it's not automatically being converted to one behind the scenes that's why we're doing it this way uh again if i manage to fix that if i can get non if i can get fractional values i will um you guys have access to the same library as i can so if you feel savvy with c um particularly boost in python uh, which is the underlying library which pi bluezet is built on um then we may be able to break that restriction, but at the moment, that is a restriction. Alrighty, um, a little longer than normal, but uh, that's fine. Um, I want everyone to just want to remind everyone that uh, we will have uh, uh, a seminar and uh, and a discussion on the sixth. Uh, so I know for some of us that's a holiday as well. <laughs> Um, but uh, I wish everybody a happy weekend. Enjoy the weather if you can. Stay safe, of course. Stay healthy.